All right, Dan always, if he gets a chance, uh, sticks me with this fatherhood shtick. Um, I have no idea why. It could be because of this great book, Being Dad, Father, a Picture of God's Grace, which makes great Christmas gifts, by the way, um, <laughs> that he does that. I'm certain that that's why it is, as a matter of fact. Um, and I, I want to say that when I, when I first started teaching on being dad, I found it rather edifying to get to talk about fatherhood all the time. And the more I taught on it, the more I began to understand something that I didn't really understand all that much. And I'll explain why. I didn't understand all that much how complicated the idea of fatherhood was and is to people. The basic premise of the book is that as the subtitle says, that fathers can be, good fathers can be an analogy to God's grace or a picture of God's grace, a concept I still wholeheartedly stand behind, but I really didn't understand at all how complicated that message was to some people. You see, I, as if you've read the book, you know this, my dad died when I was very young, so effectively I have no memory of my father. So effectively, like as my life in my life as I remember it, I don't have a dad. Now, this means that every time I thought of a good dad, I was able to sort of conjure up this imaginary picture of the perfect dad that didn't have sort of the everyday foibles that even good fathers have on a day-to-day basis. And I know this now because I'm a father, and I think if I listen to my children that there are certain foibles that I have. <clears throat> I don't always agree with their assessment of that. But they do mention it from time to time. Secondly, in place of having a dad, um, I sort of was always on the lookout for great mentors or father figures that could sort of fill that gap for me. Many of them are in this room right now. Kurt Winrich is over here to my left. Rod Rosenblatt's in the back. Jim Nestigan was in the back, although he disappeared somewhere. Ron Hodel's over here. These men, at various times and in various ways throughout my life, really sort of created for me a picture um, that very much matched what I wrote in the book from time to time. But even then, they weren't my dad, and so I didn't spend 24 hours a day with them from the time I was born till the time I was 18 or whatever and moved out, and I didn't understand all of their foibles, and it didn't help me understand how complicated this idea was. So thus, when I would go out and teach on the idea of fatherhood, I would stick to sort of reciting the story of the prodigal son, as Rod had taught me, pictures of God's grace, the father running towards the son and embracing him as he'd come away from the far-off land. And I would do that for you today in great detail if Dan hadn't stole it last night. So after I axed out the first third of my talk and replaced it with this, this is what I ended up on. When I would go out and teach on this subject and understand how complicated not only the idea of fatherhood was, but fathers themselves would, I realized that when I would say, Father, as a picture of God's grace, many heard not gospel, but law. And then beyond that, I had to understand something else, something that was very, very hard for me to get a handle on. And that's that many people had or have bad fathers. And the picture I was creating wasn't necessarily that helpful for them. We'll do more on that at the end. I'm going to do what no professor should ever do and ask you to hang on to that idea for a few minutes. Where I've landed is that I think there's a question And I think it's a question that we need to ask ourselves when we think of this idea of the Father's love for us in Christ. We need to ask ourselves, how do we expect to be treated by God our Father? Not how do we want to be treated, but how do we expect to be treated by God our Heavenly Father? And I think there's a couple options here. Do we expect that God the Father is going to treat us as though we are mere offspring under the law 
of a tyrannical father. I think many people think that way. I think many people have experiences with fathers that drive them to that conclusion. Or do we expect to be treated as children of an Abba father who loves us in Christ? Now, I have recently been watching this uh, show uh, that I was very much talked into watching called The Chosen. Now, I was talked into watching The Chosen because somebody's like, you should watch this Jesus show. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to hate it. (laughs) And they're like, no, it's a Jesus show. And I'm like, yes, I heard you the first time. (laughs) I'm fairly certain I'm going to hate it. I don't think you listened to me, actually. And they're like, but it's really good. And I said, hmm. Probably not. <clears throat> and then by about the 10th person that heard that, I, was, I had gone from probably not to, you really think so? And they're like, yeah, that's going to be good. And then finally, I was at a, one of our gatherings that we occasionally do in San Clemente, and I heard Rod Rosenblatt going on and on about how good The Chosen was, and I was like, what? <laughs> the reason I'm pretty sure I would hate this show is because Rod taught me to hate shows like this. <clears throat> so what's going on here? And so I watched it, uh, first season at least. We haven't started, Joy and I haven't started the second season yet. I'm sure we will uh, soon. But I was honestly blown away. I mean, I don't believe I got through a single episode without crying. Um, There are just some scenes in there. You know, uh, Mary Magdalene, good luck getting through that one. Um, You know, things like that. But one of the things I love is how... In the show, when somebody has a relationship with their father, even, say, with Matthew, um, this relationship with his father isn't very good at the beginning, but kind of gets better towards the end of season one. When they say father, they're saying Abba in the show. And it's, I told my friend Kurt that one of the reasons this show is good for me is because I don't have a very good imagination. Um, I see words, that's why I don't, I'm not really good at reading poetry. I see words on a page, and I see the words on the page, and I comprehend the words on the page, but I don't really create pictures of the words in my head, like many people do. I'm just like, well, that's very interesting. Thank you. Kind of like a robot. Um, but something like The Chosen helps me, because somebody else can put a picture up there, and I can see it, and then it's very meaningful to me. And to see these children, grown children in this show, referring to the fathers that they love very much and don't want to disappoint and are trying to help at times, um, to see them and just look at them and say, Abba, it became very meaningful to me uh, that we are allowed to cry out. I'd say more meaningful to me that we are allowed to cry out, Abba, Father. Those are the questions. Are we mere offspring of a tyrannical father constantly trying to earn his affection by works of the law, Or are we children of Abba, Father, who loves us so much that he brings us to himself in Christ? Now, Caleb last night, if you were at his talk, said he would refuse to create a straw man that he then tore down in his talk. Um, That shows that he is a more ethical person than I am, because what I am now going to do is create an online straw man that I will destroy in my talk. So here we go. On the socials, as the kids probably used to say, um, which is funny because I'm not so much on the socials myself, um, but on the socials as it's sort of given to me by other sources constantly, we have a policy at 1517 that we don't respond to anything negative that's said about us online. We don't respond, period, in the end. That's, we don't have a lot of policies. There's two of them. That's one of them. You don't respond to anything that's said na- negative about said online. But this does not stop everybody that's on staff who is on the socials from constantly haranguing me with what people just said against us on the socials. <clears throat> no matter how much I asked them to stop, including my wife, as we're sitting uh, over coffee in the morning. Did you see that? Nope, I didn't see it. Well, this is what it said. It said, <laughs> said I didn't see. Okay. That's fine. On the socials, it seems um, that there are many people out there in this wide, diverse world of ours that would rather be ruled by that as terrified offspring under the law of that tyrannical father than by a good and gracious God and father. Or maybe even they'd rather be ruled by that sort of tyrannical father picture 
than even by God our Abba Father. The problem, the main problem that I have with this is it seems to be the same situation whether you're sort of strictly in the secular world or in the world of the church. In the secular world, you have sort of movements over the past however many years, probably since the beginning of time, that literally have devoted themselves to blowing up the idea of morality, just destroying it. I mean, we can sort of see this as prevalent in our world today where deconstructive movements just constantly deconstruct anything that we held dear that we thought was good, right, and salutary from the past, and they just tear it down constantly. And after they destroy it, they seem to usher in a new and impossible to live up to ethic and morality, impossible to live up to because it's constantly changing. But not only is it constantly changing, and more than that, it seems always to be based in fear, absolutely devoid of redemption, and absent any kind of forgiveness. I listen to my detriment oftentimes to some political podcasts, probably always to my detriment. And on these political podcasts, some of the commentators will even point out Non-Christian commentators will point out that the problem with cancel culture that we live in now is that it's a culture, like Dan said last night, that requires confession because it's danger, but it's dangerous because it's absent absolution. And this is where we live. But then I cast my gaze upon the church and travel from church to church and place to place and listen to podcasts and hear the reports on the social, socials from the staff and my kids. And it seems like preachers of an ever-eternal law are always haranguing, confusing the gospel of Christ with, much like the secular, fear, devoid of redemption, especially if that redemption is supposed to cover Christians too, and absent forgiveness. Movements of people, secular and in the church, scared, acting like mere offspring, not children of Abba Father, not trusting on God's grace on account of Christ, desperately seeking the approval of a tyrant by means of the law. And what's being offered to them is literally the eternal mercy of the King of Kings, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who spoke all things into existence with a mere word. And he, that person, invites them to call him Abba, Father. I heard uh, John, my friend John Hoyam talking about this the other night at the pig roast at Sarah Crowder's house, uh, a pretty sermon on Psalm 130 that I didn't uh, read but he pointed out that Psalm 134 is, uh, with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared, which was the subject of this uh, sermon. And I thought, this matches exactly, I think this is the missing puzzle piece that I've been struggling with here. With God, on account of Christ, there is forgiveness, therefore people are terrified of him. Forgiveness is scary. Forgiveness means that Somebody has seen everything that you've done. Forgiveness means that every, somebody has heard every thought that you've uttered that you thought no one knew about. Forgiveness means that somebody knows you. And that's terrifying. I point out in, the, in being dad that a good father isn't one that looks over every sin. That's not what forgiveness means. A good father is one that knows the sin of his children and for the sake of Christ, forgives them anyway. That's scary. Fear means then that they prefer to cling to the law and to treat God their Abba Father not at, just as a tyrant, but as a schoolmaster, always seeking from him just mere instruct, instruction on how to live, how to do better, where to go from here. But a schoolmaster... Even if that schoolmaster has its, he is a useful part of a child's life, a schoolmaster is not a father. 
The schoolmaster, and the schoolmaster that's talked about in Galatians 3, is a schoolmaster that serves a purpose. That schoolmaster that was the law had a job, a very defined job. Galatians 3, 20, 23. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So if you are in Christ, then you are no longer under the tyranny of the schoolmaster. You are within the love of the eternal father. You are adopted as his child. You belong to him. He has claimed you. He has taken you out of the custody of the schoolmaster and put you in his custody to be in his hand forevermore. And no one can ever pluck you out of that hand. All this for the sake of Christ. So then, because I'm like my buddy Melanchthon and I like my lists very much, we are called to maybe to called. Called not to and called to. Called not to live as terrified students under a tyrannical schoolmaster, but called to trust in the mercy of Abba Father on account of Christ alone. Yet this gospel truth, this Abba Father reality, is just so often rejected. The fearful accusers of the gospelers, who are the gospelers, people? Not rhetorical. Who are the gospelers? You are welcome to say, I am. Who rests in the gospel of Christ Jesus as your only hope for salvation? You are. You are the gospelers. The fearful accusers will come out of the woodwork. They have come out of the woodwork and they level accusations at you. They will say to you, because you trust in that mercy of God on account of Christ alone and you talk about it so darn much and it's just so upsetting that you don't talk about your good works enough, they'll say to you, You're an antinomian. You're one of the lawless ones, aren't you? I can see you coming from a mile away, and you're pretty dangerous. And you'll say, I'm not an antinomian. They'll say, that's fine. You're a soft antinomian then. (laughs) And I'll say, I don't even know what that means. Well, they say it's almost as bad as an antinomian, but still pretty bad. Okay? They'll look at you gospelers, and they'll say, you know what I think? I don't think I'm hearing enough of that, as my friend uh, David Zoll would say, little L law coming out of your mouth. In fact, I can't remember the last time you told somebody to balance their checkbook for Jesus. I don't remember the last time you gave a chore list at the end of your sermon. What's going on here? Are you missing the point altogether? Those accusers are going to come out of the woodwork, and they're going to say to you, you know what? I think you're talking too much about this trust in the Father's love for the sake of Christ. Don't you have anything better to talk about? You sound like a broken record. Okay. They're going to come out of the woodwork and you're going to say, you talk too much about this gospel of Christ Jesus. Are you a gospel reductionist? Is this all you care about? And here's the one that really gets them. They'll say, you know what I've heard you say way too much? You've said you are forgiven to people. And you're not saying it to non-Christian. That's okay. That's how we get them in the door. That's how we bait and switch them. That's how we get them to break out their checkbook on Sunday morning. That's fine. Tell the non-Christians they're forgiven. But you're saying it to Christians. How do you know they've changed their life enough? Have they changed their heart? Have they given it all to Jesus And you walk around telling them you're free. Who do you think you are forgiving their sins? Do you think you're God? To all of that, I say, bull stuff. Personally, if I had a choice, I'd rather be accused of being a soft antinomian who is certain of the Abba Father's love for me on account of Christ, than a flaccid Pharisee trying to earn a tyrant's approval by works of a law. I think every gospeler at one point in time, if you are a gospeler, if you're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be called an antinomian, and that's okay. 
But just in case you start to get a big head, and I was really worried about this section that you were going to start to get a big head all about yourself, I want to remind you of something. You are a sinner. Hear me here. You really are. You are a sinner. You have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed. You have done things that are deplorable to him. And you have not done many, many things he has fully expected and commanded you to do. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You are included in that all, people. You are. Isaiah 59.2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. Don't overlook that. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. 1 John 1.8, if we, have, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and we're very good at deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, I've talked a lot about this Abba Father who loves you very, very much. But I can honestly tell you that apart from Christ, your God is not your Abba. Sin separates you from him and leaves you in desperate need of saving. You cry out with Paul, who would deliver me from this body of death? Your answer is not as clean as Paul's likely, though, because you likely have something rattling around in your head. Will I save myself? Will the law still save me? Can somebody else save me? Or will the Father provide my Savior? So therefore, your Abba Father has sent Christ to be your Savior. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. John 1, 12, but to all who, who did receive him, he believed in his, and believed in his name, he gave the right, the right. When we start talking about our rights, maybe we ought to talk about this one, the right to become children of God. You see, you are a sinner in thought, word, and deed, but God has provided the answer for that for you. He has sent Christ to be your Savior, and on account of that Christ, He has adopted you as His child. Literal adoption as child. Chose you to be His from before the foundation of the world. Worked out that adoption in real time in history, not only through the death and resurrection of His only Son, but by sending to you a preacher who showered you with God's Word who showered you with water in the word, who puts the bread and the wine, the body and blood in your mouth and says, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. And when he does that, when that preacher does that, just as when the grave spit Jesus out of the ground, your Abba Father spit all of your sin, death and destruction right out of his mouth. Now we gospelers, that's us again, in case you weren't following along or dozed off for a pappy nappy. We gospelers know a few things. First, we know the Father's love for us in Christ equals our great hope and assurance. If you wanted to know the answer to the question of why we're here talking about assurance, that's it. The Father loves you in Christ so much that he sent his only son to be your savior. And in him, you will have eternal life. Amen? Amen. But we know another little secret that the law clingers don't always know so well. Uh, could I have the picture that I asked for while I fix my thing? You see, I have a dog. Now you're asking yourself, what the heck does a dog have to do with the love of God the Father in Christ? Ah, I will tell you. Um, <clears throat> this picture will tell you a lot about my life over the last year. It'll tell you that I have a husky on the right whose name is Kai. Um, who's 15 years old. She looks pretty good for an, for an old bat, doesn't she? Um, and I have a puppy whose name is Lucy on the left. Lucy's very sick right now, by the way. It's, it's heartbreaking to me. And you can, tell me by the, you can tell by the electrical socket that's not quite finished behind the dogs that I've been remodeling a house for a year, right? So pray for me, because my wife uh, 
likes to uh, ride me through it. Let's just say that. Now, the dog on the right, Kai, she was a legitimate sled dog. For years, uh, I, I took her out with other Siberian Huskies that we had to a little place called Hope Valley up in the Lake Tahoe area that is, in the winter, a very, very cold place. In fact, in fact it's one of the most continuously kind of cold places um, in the lower 48, like day and night, just because of the valley that it's in and the elevation that it's at and everything, glaciers and everything. It's a cold place, but we'd go dog sledding out there, and Kai was the lead dog. Right? And Kai, she's 15, let me, did I mention she's 15? Right? She's 15 years old, but she was the lead dog. And you can tell by the fear on Lucy's face, maybe, that Kai still believes she's the lead dog. Right? She remembers the day when it was her job to keep all of the other idiot huskies in line because she was the smart one, right? Lead dogs have a job. It's pretty much to make sure the wheel dogs don't do crazy stuff. And they do that by snipping at them and barking at them and yelling at them and attacking them in the whole nine yards. And Kai remembers when that was her job. Right? So she goes around snarling at everything and every you try to pick up her food and just growling at you. The puppy walks by and making the puppy a nervous wreck all the time, which has become a bit of a problem. Right? But Kai is a lot like the law. Right? Because I know something that you don't know, just like we know something that the law dogs don't know. Right? That about a year and a half ago. We had to pull out almost all of Kai's teeth because they were rotten. So nobody else knows that as she barks and snarls and snaps, everyone else says, oh, she's a real dangerous critter. But much like the law, she has no teeth left. It can bark and it can snarl and it can growl and it can accuse and it can bite at you all at once. But the worst it could do would be to gum you to death. That's our secret, right? This is the Father's love assurance that he gives to us is not in the law. You can change pictures now, unless everybody wants to look at Kai and Lucy. All right. (laughs) And just in case you were wondering, too, uh, neither is this about your faithfulness, right? we kind of can sometimes get the impression that, okay, 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 Scott, it's not dependent on my fulfilling the law, but at least it has to be dependent on me being faithful, right? I have to persist until death, right? I got to make it. I got to run the race, right? Well, I think you might be reading those verses wrong. Because I think the reality is that God the Father for the sake of Christ will always be more gracious to you than you will ever be faithful to him. And on that point, if you held on to what I asked you to at the beginning, here's the now more about fathers being complicated. I told you my difficulties in teaching this from being dad, which I did pretty consistently um, for several years. I still contend uh, that the love of good father is a powerful analogy in this life to the love of God, our heavenly father, and that it's still a very workable lesson. Yet I've learned that fathers are frail and that fathers fail. Fathers, at best, disappoint us. At worst, they're evil to us. And in the middle, they do all sorts of other things. Maybe they leave for a time or forever. Maybe they die and we're mad at them for it. And maybe they do even more than that. I think I was trying to put it together, but if you know me, you know I'm horrible at dates and that kind of thing. I think it was in 2009. I had gone up to Trinity Lutheran College up in um, Washington. I don't remember the name of the city right now. And this microphone, as always, is bugging me. Um, And I was teaching up there. My friend named Jeff Mallinson was the academic dean up at the school, and he had me come up, which he did uh, for a couple years, to teach a class on Melanchthon to his undergrad students. My friend John Hoyam was there for that class. 
And it was great. We got into some trouble that we're still paying the price for during that week. Um, but it was a great trip, great teaching event. My wife and I were driving home, and I believe we stopped at Jim and Carolyn's house in Dallas, Oregon, and say, said hi uh, for a day or two. I think that was maybe the time my wife left their chacos on your porch. And then we drove down again, um, down to uh, northern Nevada, where we were living at the time. And I remember it pretty distinctly. Uh, we were just crawling into bed, and we got a call um, from my mother-in-law telling us that my father-in-law had killed himself. Now, my father-in-law was always a complicated character. He had served in the Vietnam War and had done things in the Vietnam War that he just could not get over. And I was not a good enough preacher to him uh, to recognize. I would say I did not have my ear tuned to confession at that point in time to recognize that he needed an absolution. Um, and he spent year upon year going to counseling and in and out of counseling, in and, in and out of uh, even residential counseling. And it just never got better. And one day he got to be overwhelmed by it and he took his own life. I remember my wife and I hopped in the car uh, fairly immediately after just getting back from a very long trip and started out the now longer trek down to Mesa, Arizona, where her parents lived to help out as much as we could, of course, and to attend to the needs of the funeral. And I remember we got to about the Palm Springs area, or even maybe it was the San Bernardino area, it's all kind of foggy for me, and that we were just exhausted, physically exhausted from all the time traveling and from driving, mentally and emotionally and even spiritually exhausted from the harsh reality it is when somebody takes their own life and leaves you. Leaves you wanting your dad, in my wife's case, very much. And leaves me missing the only father that I had had in a very long time. And I remember calling Jim Nestigan and telling him, with joy in the car, putting him on speakerphone and saying, hey, Jim, and him asking in his cheerful way, hey, guys, did you make it home okay? And I said, we're in San Bernardino. We're stopped on the side of the road. And I just need to tell you that we're traveling because Joy's dad killed himself this week. And without missing a beat, Jim says to me, blessed are the poor in spirit, For theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. And I was blown away by that response. He said, who could be more poor in spirit than somebody who thought they had no other option? So as I put this talk together, <coughs> I asked myself a simple question. How great is God the Father's love for us in Christ? How great is it? And I came up with some answers. I hope you like them. It's so great that he gives you Christ even when you are the poor in spirit and you see no other way out. Even when you're desperate and the thing that's not even an option all of a sudden becomes the only option to you. The love of the Father for you is so great that he gives you Christ when you are an unfaithful spouse. Or even when you're like most of us and are only unfaithful with your eyes and your thoughts. How great is the Father's love for you in Christ? It's so great that he gives you Christ if you are a hopeless, ragged man or woman. He gives you Christ even when you think you are someone who has it all put together, which is maybe a harder situation for him. How great is the Father's love for you in Christ? It's so great that he gives you Christ if you're a good father, and he gives you Christ if you're a bad father, and if he gives you Christ if you're like my father-in-law 
a terrified, desperate father. How great is the father's love for you in Christ? It's so great that he gives you Christ in this life, whether you're successful in this life or an utter failure in this life. How great is the Father's love for you in Christ? So great that he gives you Christ. If you're a great Christian, a good Christian, or like most of us, just a Christian. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples, I was thinking, the chosen, by the way, does a great job of this. <laughs> when he asks his disciples, I love it when he asks his disciples questions because you never know what's going to fly out of their, their dumb mouths, right? <clears throat> he says, who do people say that I am? And they're like, oh, 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 I know. Uh, some people are saying John the baptizer. He's like, yeah, that's not it. <clears throat> some people say you're Elijah. He's like, nope, not Elijah. Uh, how about Jeremiah? And he's like, no, I'm not Jeremiah. How about one of the prophets? Well, <clears throat> no, not just a prophet. And then he gets sick of their dumb answers. Um, I, my thing with Jesus is always just like this. <clears throat> He's like, who do you say that I am? And Peter, uh, who will never fail to pipe up, uh, by the way, Chosen does a great job of that, too, says, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus I'm sure, unless he was at that exact moment reading his mind, had to be a little surprised at how good the answer was. And says, you know what, Peter? This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So let me tell you something that's not going to be revealed to you by flesh or blood, but by your Father in heaven. The Father loves you in Christ. You can be assured of that. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was incarnate to live in your stead, to die in your stead, to raise as the first fruits of your resurrection, and He has adopted you as His child in Christ. You are His, and you can't do nothing about it, so just get used to it. The Father loves you in Christ, and that alone is your greatness, and that alone is your assurance. And now you can be assured of some things. You can be assured that he will care for you. You can be assured that he will protect you. You can be assured that he will provide for all of your needs. You can be assured that he will show you mercy as an Abba Father because of Christ. You can be assured of this that he will call preachers into your life that will do their job and that will tell you as I do now that you are forgiven by your heavenly Father of all your sins because of Christ alone. Amen. That's how great the Father's love for you is in Christ. So thus, to carry on a tradition from Bentonville and with my spectacles on, on account of Christ, we have the assurance and trust to say with Luther, I believe that God has made me in all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, all my limbs, my reason and all my senses, and still preserves them. In addition thereto, clothing and shoes, meat and drink, house and home, wife and children, fields and cattle, and all my goods, that he provides me richly and daily with all that I need to support this body and life, protects me from all harm and danger, and guards and preserves me from all evil, and all of this out of pure fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness within me for all which I owe it to him to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. And thank you for coming to Here We Still Stand, Las Vegas, 2021.